So we need to watch out that the practices or the breathing practices are systematic and correctly practiced. Rather than do too many breathing practices, it's better to do simple practices, start with few practices, but do them correctly. I mentioned that we can do diaphragmatic breathing to correct first the breathing pattern that you have and most of us are not breathing correctly so that is something that everybody can do. There are many benefits of breathing exercises. Yes, it, it will oxygenate your brain and it makes you more aware makes you sharper, you don't fall asleep. It will remove the toxins in your lungs. Certain breathing practices which we will discuss churn up the energy level in the body. And this is very important. It's a bit like stirring up um, you know, putting things together in the fire and stirring up the fire. Um, the practice of Bhastrika, for example, takes its name after this. The bellows. You know what the bellows are? It's like when you make a fire and you need to fan the fire. You need to give it some air. Every time you fan the fire, you make the fire stronger. And the bellows are a kind of an instrument that's used by ironsmiths, for example, when they had these very, very hot fires, they used these to make the fire stronger. These are called bellows. And the reason for that is the Bastika is named the bellows, not only because the motion of breathing is making this kind of sound which is similar to the bellows but because it actually fans the fire in the body. It activates your energies. So the part about removing the toxins. Removing the toxins is there is a lot of carbon dioxide in the lungs which Sometimes people have found, you know, they estimate that the carbon dioxide in the lungs is there, is very old because we are not breathing out completely. We are not breathing correctly. And these breathing practices will actually remove that old carbon dioxide from your lungs, expand your lungs and oxygenate your blood and also your brain, making you more alert. Very often we think of relaxation as merely lying down in Shavasana and sort of doing nothing. This is the idea of relaxation in yoga. People have different ideas of what relaxation means. For some people relaxation is, you know, having a beer and hanging out with friends. For others relaxation is watching movies or going for a walk. Everybody has a different idea of relaxation. From a yogic perspective, relaxation is removal of toxins. That is what relaxation means. Deep, extreme relaxation. One of the most fascinating aspects of pranayam is that it is in fact relaxation. Yet at the same time, it churns up the energy in us. It seems to be conflicting, but it's not. For example, certain practices seem to churn up the energy, like Bhastrika, Kapalbhati, yet they remove the toxins and the body seems to relax. Practices like 61 points, which is a more detailed version of Shavasana, energize the channels in the body and yet they are a form of relaxation. And if you think of relaxation as removal of toxins, that makes sense. 
If you look for a Sanskrit word for relaxation, you will not find it. If you try to explain to people well, what is actually the relaxation techniques, are they coming under asanas? What is it? And many people will put things like Shavasan under asanas. Shavasan is a more generalized version of 61 points. Since many people are not able to practice it because they do not have a concentration, a very generalized version was created and that we call Shavasan. But the original exercise, 61 points, is known as Shav Yatra, Journey Through the Corpse. It goes through the entire body. So then, what are relaxation exercises called in Sanskrit? What was the original term? Guess what? That term relaxation was made up by modern yogis because they could not explain this apparently conflicting idea to people, to modern people. They could not explain the fact that while it seems to relax, it is actually activating your system and your energies. So all these practices like Shavyatra are pranayama practices. In English, we just call them relaxation, but in fact, they are pranayams. But we will come to that later, and we will attend to that in greater detail when we come to the advanced pranayama section. For those who are, were not there before, um, we, we are going through the sessions on mastering pranayam will be in two sections, the basic and then the advanced. We are still at the basic practices. So now we come to the actual seven step program. So you will find this um, on the website, Equal Breathing, and here I have introduced the seven step program. <clears throat> Aranka, uh, what was that? This is pranayam exercises? Uh, Shavasan? Yes. 61 points is actually pranayam. Most people think, okay. yeah, most people classify them as asanas, and the reason for that is that since they have not been introduced properly and they have not really understood the depth of the practice, when you don't do the practice effectively, it seems to just relax you. But it is, in fact, a pranayam practice if it is done correctly. Okay. Yeah, I'm just still a little bit confused about uh, what actually is, is a breathing exercise and what actually is a pranayama exercise. But I think I, I'm i not, or maybe the answer will come uh, if I look carefully. <laughs> yeah, uh, don't let that bother you too much. Uh, for okay. most of the time you can say simply things which have to do with the breath, what you can do with the breath are breathing exercises. And that which you do with the mind, that is pranayam. So, uh, also the uh, nadisharana, the, the nadisharana is, is doing by the mind, so not with your fingers, but with, with your mind. You can classify this as a pranayam. Yes, when you are doing it with mind, yes. When you're doing okay. it with your fingers, not. When you're doing it with fingers, okay. it's just a breathing exercise. But if you have mastered 
and have the ability to change your breath at will using your mind power, using your concentration, then yeah. it is a pranayam. A lot okay. of people are doing something with their minds. <laughs> you know what I mean? But not yeah. necessarily that they're succeeding in changing the flow of the breath. Okay. okay. So when you are yeah, actually okay. able to change the flow of the breath using your attention, then you are doing pranayam. Nice. Thank you. Okay. So... The seven step program starts with basically establishing natural, effortless, diaphragmatic breathing. So if you haven't already been breathing diaphragmatically, we did the test, we ran the test sometime ago, a couple of sessions ago, and I said, put your one hand on the chest and one hand on the uh, abdomen or between the ribs in the abdomen and just observe your breathing. If your chest is moving, then your chest breathing. And if your abdomen is moving, then you're doing diaphragmatic breathing. If both are moving, <laughs> that means you're doing both, partly diaphragmatic, partly chest breathing. What we need to do is in a natural state, when you're not under any kind of stress, normal day-to-day -day life, you should be doing diaphragmatic breathing. If you do not do normally diaphragmatic breathing, then you really need to retrain your body and your, your mind so that you can do that all the time, naturally. You can test yourself every now and then for maybe the next one week when we catch up next Sunday you can tell me how your breathing was, whether it was diaphragmatic or not. And we have already discussed the practice for strengthening diaphragmatic breathing, which is basically lying in Makarasan and or practicing Shavasan with your hand on the abdomen and or using weights like a sandbag or uh, heavy blankets so that you're doing some sort of a weight lifting and this is the way to establish natural effortless diaphragmatic breathing that's a prerequisite there cannot be any discussion or compromise there if you do not have natural effortless diaphragmatic breathing and you move on to the next step there is a danger that you would be damaging yourself. The lung has a very, very fine tissue. It's fine cilia, hair, you know, in the lungs. Incorrect breathing. When you start doing breathing exercises and you have not established diaphragmatic breathing, now imagine you're doing bhastrika or one of these more uh, stronger exercises, but you're breathing all from the chest all the time and not from the diaphragm, you can injure your lungs. There are a lot of yoga studios out there, a lot of yoga teachers out there who are teaching practices that they don't even know themselves and they're teaching some very violent pranayama practices. So that's something you need to take care about, of that you don't damage at a physical level lung tissue and at a pranic level have a chronic disturbance in your pranic vehicles. You should be prepared to spend a few weeks to even a few months establishing diaphragmatic breathing. It's really extremely important. Uh, I have a question, but yeah, go ahead. Hello? Uh, this is uh, regarding the energy thing, so uh, it's a little bit out of context. Uh, mm -hmm. I just, so, uh, when you uh, is it still okay, or yeah, go ahead. Are you finishing up? 
I'm sorry. So, uh, but when you were talking about the energies getting activated by certain practices like Kapalbhati or Bastrika, mm-hmm. uh, they are churning up energies. Yeah. Now, is the energy that is churned up kind of something like heating a pot of water where, you know, or heating some tea where you've heated it and you have to kind of use it immediately for the effect? Or is it more of, you know, a churned up energy that is that is there in your system where you've kind of increase the energy levels in your system which which will spill out later both is it something that you turn up for your practice immediately or is it something that you turn up in your system no it's both of course um, when you do these practices and you're churning up a lot of energy um, and you do a, uh, sorry you do a meditation practice directly after that you can utilize of course that energy for your meditation it keeps you wide awake, gives you alert, it gives you that fine, subtle energy that you need to be able to observe your thoughts. As well as it provides you with more energy in all departments of life. These will spill over. So it's not as if, you know, it's only for meditation. When you practice this regularly, then it will spill over into every department of your life all the time. You will feel more energetic, you will feel calmer, you will feel more alert, you will be more observant, you will be balanced, you will be more creative, you will be healthier in all areas. So regular practice, daily practice is very beneficial. So back to the first step, and that's the natural, effortless, diaphragmatic breathing. Once you have spent maybe one or two months on establishing this, you need to work on establishing even breath. Even or equal breath is, inhalation is equal to exhalation. That's what it means. It means in terms of duration, inhalation is equal to exhalation. It means in terms of the amount of breath or air that you take in is equal to the amount of air you exhale. So in that sense, your breath is even or equal. This even breath is also extremely important for our day-to-day normal breathing. But it is especially important for practice. So the first two are prerequisites, they're criterion, they're very important. And we need to have that all the time. When we start practicing these breathing exercises, very often we find in certain yoga studios or yoga styles, they're taught to make a very loud noise while breathing. You know, it goes something like... So is this really noisy inhalation and exhalation? And somehow... There's this misconception that that is good. I presume that this this idea comes from people who are trying to compete with each other or, you know, who can breathe faster and deeper and longer and louder or whatever the competition is about. But you don't need to make any noise. In fact, it should be completely silent. The fourth aspect is a very smooth breath, without jerks. It becomes very fine now. As we start integrating this into our regular breathing practice, becoming very fine. 
So you can do diaphragmatic breathing and make the diaphragmatic breathing equal breath. So you're having the diaphragmatic breathing and at the same time it's equal. And it's silent and it's smooth. When you have got so far, then you can integrate the sixth, uh, fifth step. This step is a little bit more difficult to integrate. And this is eliminating the extended pauses between inhalation and exhalation. Very unconsciously, we tend to have a pause there between the inhalation and the exhalation and the inhalation. There's always a slight pause. It's, a, it's, a, it's very minor, but as we're getting subtler and subtler, these pauses seem to begin to disturb. It has now become so subtle that we often talk of this example in the traditions that when you are looking in the night sky and you want to spot the north star, the, the polar star, it's very difficult to spot it immediately. So what most people do is they look for the bear, the great bear also known as the plow. And when they've seen the plow, they look at the star, they are able to kind of align it, and you know, find the polar star. So we go from gross to subtle. And that's what's happening now. From a very gross diaphragmatic breathing on an equal breathing and we have made our breath already subtler with silent breathing very smooth breathing with our jerks and now it gets even finer we are trying to eliminate the pauses between inhalation and exhalation when you have succeeded in doing that it's a big step when you can do that you can focus now on elongating the breath. That means increasing the length of inhalation and exhalation. If your normal breath, let's take an example, is three seconds in and three seconds out, you can now start elongating it to maybe four seconds in and four seconds out and then to six seconds in and six seconds out, and so on and so forth. It keeps continuing. And when you have started elongating the breath, you keep elongating the breath, and as you do that, eventually you come to seven, the seventh step. Then you start beginning to understand, experience, and attain mastery over prana itself. It's at step seven that you're starting really pranayam where you're using your mind. Pranayam, advanced pranayam practices. When I say advanced pranayam practices, you will see that something like 61 points or shavyatra comes under advanced pranayam practices. But you may know the technique of it. You know the technique and you're practicing the technique doesn't mean that you have mastery over prana. You need to go through the steps. So but before you start, you need to first begin with diaphragmatic breathing and then move on to even breath. Uh, the goal is to have uh, this in regular day to day breathing as well, all these steps? Not all, but definitely the first two. Diaphragmatic and equal breathing in day-to-day -day life. You should have. The moment you are under a little bit of stress, 
immediately you will find that this might just go off when you are then so conscious and so aware you will feel that okay now my breath is not not diaphragmatic and that it's agitated and until you get to that level of awareness at least you know you should have it um, at all times when you're not under extreme stress or or you know emotionally upset or so in the regular times while the others they are now a part of a continuing process of developing mastery in pranayam these are breathing exercises but through these breathing exercises we are getting to that subtle level of prana that's why i gave the example of the stars you know finding the polar star first by going to the bigger brighter stars so it's like using the breath the physical breath to move slowly to the more subtle prana which is at the level of the mind and body of course the channels i had a question mm-hmm. is it actually when you go into this um, experience of prana mm. that you go beyond the breath actually and that you because i i remember this feeling that when you go really it becomes so subtle that you are not even noticing that you're breathing yeah 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 um, yes and uh, so that actually to experience prana you have to leave the breath so to say behind you mm. is that uh, correct yeah i would say first at this point here between 4 and 5 when you've established this really smooth fine breathing and then you're starting to inhale eliminate the pauses then your breath is becoming so fine that at some point of time you might think that you you're, you're not breathing you are breathing still but it's very fine you have not attained that breathless state that will come but the breath is very fine now and so if somebody external would come and put his finger below your nostrils they actually might not find feel your breath they might an external observer might say you're not breathing but you are breathing so it's only so fine that you barely notice it you still haven't reached the breathless state but you're getting there so what that actually be you know explaining there are these incidences where yogis have been um buried alive <laughs> and they remain for a year <laughs> so, <laughs> i think yogi will so do that we will we will discuss that in the advanced prana section because that <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> i just wanted to understand the concept i guess they have something that they're doing there Um, which we, is from prana exercises pranayama <laughs> we will do that in the advanced pranayama se- section i'm sure by the end of this uh, series of lectures we will all be ready to be buried on the ground we start with you <laughs> and these lectures are so so clear and <laughs> useful that we are going to be yogi after finishing the whole session so from now we will get to a more uh, basic question can i ask yeah. a question about the sure. uh, role yeah. in uh eco breath and yeah. extended uh breathing mm-hmm. um should should you i i tend to you know practice uh, long eco breath like throughout the day yeah um and i do use my uh, abdominal muscles to push the air out mm-hmm. uh and because i've established such a strong pattern of that mm-hmm. when i do start meditating sometimes i notice that um i tend to get distracted by um this pattern of breath of you know using the abdominals yeah. muscles to control the breath and i wonder if you could just speak about that a bit Uh, you get distracted at what time uh, at at the point where you actually want to leave your breath behind and go to meditation yeah because i can kind of sense the the you know like releasing of the the abdominal muscles you know or the kind of the interaction between the the uh the diaphragm and the and the muscles itself yeah um i'm not quite getting this you're getting distracted while you're doing the diaphragmatic breathing or when you're 
trying to go to meditation? Um, with, with actually, I mean, it, it only becomes a distraction when I'm actually in meditation mm -hmm. because because it just normally, I mean, I just practice like long, you know, like in and out inhalation, yeah, of, yeah, yeah. you know, 10 to 15, 20 seconds at a time. Yeah. Um, and but I use my abdominal muscles to right. control that. Yeah. So then when I find it, when I get into meditation, I continue that and then it becomes a bit of a distraction. So I'm wondering. So you know, but what I is your objective meditation? Is, is, is it the breath? Or do you have a mantra or something? Well, I actually use Soham as well. Right. Okay. Um, well, when you use the word, I'm trying to use my, I'm trying to control my breath, you said, uh, using my abdominal muscles. Well, what I'm hearing from that is that it's still not natural. It should be unconscious. At, at any point of time, you're not continuously thinking about your breath, right? You just, you're like right now, you're not thinking about your breath. You're talking. You're thinking about what we're talking about. So, you know, I... when you start going, whether it's to Soham or whether it's to your breath between the nostrils, you should be able to leave your abdominal muscles behind. But if you cannot, that's not a, it's not too bad. What you can do is you can stay your meditation point instead of it being at the breath uh, between the nostrils, you can let your mind sort of stay at the abdomen and observe your breath going in and out at the abdomen. That's okay. That's totally, totally okay. Just use that as the object. Yes. Just use the breath at the abdomen as the object of meditation. Eventually, okay. Okay. you will find with time that at some point of time, very naturally, don't push it, don't, don't make it happen. It will happen on its own. The mind will just sort of zoom off <laughs> and go either to your nostril or simply to your mantra. I, I do find that, that, I mean, that does happen, like, this yeah. isn't, like, every time yeah. that it happens, it's just, like, sometimes I notice it, and yeah. I'm just wondering if it's because I've established that strong pattern of, you know, training the breath, and should I just let that go? Should yeah, I, yeah, you should let it go now, in the sense that if you check throughout the day a couple of times, you know, you don't have to do it all the time, just a couple of times, and you say, okay, it seems to be now that I have established diaphragmatic breathing, then you can let it go. I'm not checking my diaphragmatic breath all the time. I know it's established. If I check at any point of time, it's it's there. So I, I don't think about this anymore. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, but some, somewhat related to this, is the goal also to extend a year breathing kind of times in day-to-day -day life? Is that also a goal? Uh, extend your what breathing? And like the three seconds you said, use it as an example. Yeah. So is uh, in daily breathing when you're not actually doing the practice. Mm -hmm. Is uh, there a goal that it should be slightly longer than that? Um, whatever comes naturally. There, there's no goal over there because, um, okay. in well, yeah, in the breathing. Is, the is it or? No, what I mean is that in as you will continue your practice, I know people, I myself, at one point of time was able to do, uh, I can still do if I want, but <laughs> I don't need to, um, have a breathing pattern of 30 seconds in and 30 seconds out. That's one breath per minute. But I was not doing that all the time. I was only doing that when I did my breathing practice. Okay. So, no, we don't need to do that. Whatever is natural, it happens. You don't have to keep counting your breaths all the time, you know. So it might happen that as you do these practices over a period of time, your breath will get a little deeper. And so instead of doing three seconds, maybe you are doing four or five seconds. That's okay. okay. You, know, you don't have to start trying to breathe all the time, 30 seconds in and 30 seconds out. You, you might just go nuts if you try to do that because you're going to be trying to force it. And that also... Um, is not good for your pranic channels. Okay, Sujata said, uh, 
can we do kapal bhati regularly we haven't got to that part sujata so we will do that later um diaphragmatic breathing i have a question here yeah i'm still sorry Does gautam it... i'm just reading sujata's question uh explain the practice of diaphragmatic breathing how to start get established yeah hmm <laughs> I don't want to repeat because we had a whole session on diaphragmatic breathing and so if you would like to catch up on that you can check on our YouTube channel um the very first session is diaphragmatic breath you can have a look at that okay all right so uh, gautam you wanted to ask yeah uh, so uh so why breathing do you also keep a uh, uh, awareness on on whether it's a left nostril or a right nostril because i often find that uh, one of my nostrils is, is blocked so uh, so when you're saying equal breathing i understand it's inhalation equal to exhalation but uh, do i also need to ensure that uh, both my nostrils are able to inhale properly um uh, yes and no uh, no because we are not doing Nadi Shodnam yet we have not come to that part, but yes, ideally both nostrils should be relatively open. Uh, we have not come to the part where we open both the nostrils. That comes later. We have not got there, but that's why I mentioned that you need to clear your nostril, if necessary, using Jal Nethi so that they are relatively open, relatively speaking. Okay. but we haven't come to the satla practice of opening both nostrils we haven't come to that uh practice of sandhya yet okay so that follows i have one, i have one more uh, doubt and this is with uh, respect to uh, step number 5 when uh, mm-hmm. about uh, extended pauses yes so uh So this is uh, and if i understand correctly it's after inhalation there is a long pause before someone exhales is that uh, yes. is that what you mean by extended pause yes uh, yeah but but, uh, if... but in any breath there is going to be a pause right <laughs> we will come to that we will come we will go into detail uh, with these steps so we're going to come to that okay and um, then i will explain that a little bit more in detail okay So I want to now get back to the very basic and the very basic is where do you begin Every person mostly average person has a very short uneven breath and so you generally find that if you check your breath randomly any time um it could be something like 3 seconds in 3 seconds out I hope everybody knows the counting procedure. It's very simple. You can simply put your finger in front of your nostril, you breathe in, you count 1 2 3. Normal counting, not 1 2 3, not too fast, not too slow. And that's approximately 3 seconds. And so you first need to establish the base where you're going to start from. It's no point saying, "Okay, I'm going to start with 6 in and 6 out." that's going to be a disaster you need to start from where you are so if your average breath your the average person actually breathes something like 2 seconds in and 2 seconds out which makes the rate of 15 breaths per second oh uh, sorry per minute so you first need to see your capacity if that's what you're doing 2 seconds in and 2 seconds out you can't jump to 6 seconds out and then 6 seconds in so you start with with that by putting your finger in front of your nostrils feel your breath count the length of both the counting method is recommended because we do not want to encourage a dependency on an external object like a watch so don't use thing like a watch and please don't use some apps and stuff like that i keep meeting people who keep telling me about their great apps and they keep making strange noises and stuff like that so these are all external things and they will just distract you they will disturb you and take you away from the subtly subtle breath you're going to completely miss the subtlety 
of this if you are stuck to external objects like uh, mobile phones and apps and clocks and watches and things like that so just use the counting method count very silently in the mind and count so that each count is equal to one second so one two three is approximately three seconds you can check your breath at different times of the day and you may notice some difference in counts depending on the time of the day depending on how tired you are, depending on your emotional state, but you will find something common, a base to start with. Take always the lower number, you know, so you may find, you find that your natural breath is six, uh, five seconds in and four seconds out, then you take four seconds. Okay? You sit either in friendship pose, sitting on a chair, Back straight, Sukhasan, Swastikasan, or Sadhasan. We discussed this also in session two, so we don't have to go into it in any further details. But we take this as the base now, four seconds. If yours happens to be three seconds, then take three seconds as, as the base and then stay with that. Do it ten times, and that's called one round. After one round, you take a short break. Now you may wonder why you need to take a short break. You know, you're going to do the next round of another 10 and you're going to do a next round of another 10. You're going to do all together three rounds. So you're going to do 10 into 3. Now you're wondering why do I need a break? Okay, when you're sitting with 4 in and 4 out, you may not really need a break. But when you are at 15 in and 15 out, you might need a slight break. When you're at 30 in and 30 out, you're going to need a break. You need to allow, you need to give the time to the mind and the body to integrate that energy. You're going to be oxygenated or maybe even, you know, really charged up, depending on what, which breathing practice you're doing. So you need to take a little pause between. How long should your pause be? The pause should be as long as it takes for your breathing to get back to normal. For example, if you have Bastrika and, you know, you may take a little longer time to get your breathing back to completely to normal. So, the pause, the break rather, between the rounds is important. Don't, don't dismiss it as, you know, uh, too simple. So once you have done the counting method, you might notice that the counting even disturbs the mind. The counting itself causes some sort of subtle jerks. And so you can drop the counts. You might notice that the breath is noisy. There are, unex there are unconscious extended pauses. That's what we talked about. Uh, with Gautam just now, that there are these pauses and they're unconscious. We don't really notice them in our day-to-day -day life. So, you can drop the numbers, drop the counting, and start using <coughs> a different technique without counting, which we will come to. And in this technique, you can then focus on a silent breath without noise, a smooth breathing without jerks, and eliminating the extended pauses. Okay, so how do you do this? You can sit in your meditative pose, you breathe in from the crown of the head, sorry, breathe out from the crown of the head to the base of the spine, and breathe in from the base of the spine to the crown of the head. In this way, you inhale and exhale, the time you inhale and exhale is equal. So that's an even breath. This helps the mind to establish the even breath without counting. So you can focus on the breath and allow it to become smooth and silent and without extended pauses. You can do the same in Shavasan. You can lie down in Shavasan, breathe out from the crown of the head to the tip of the toes and breathe in 
from the tip of the toes to the crown of the head. The second po the Shavasan version, the second version, I would only recommend if you are confident enough that you're not going to fall asleep. Do not practice this if you're going to fall asleep. Because you're going to give your mind the habit of falling asleep in pranayam. It's exactly the opposite of what you want to do. You want to use the pranayam practices to become alert and not to fall asleep. Now we come to elongating the breath. So that's establishing point six now. To an even elongated breath. You're starting with four seconds in or four seconds out or however it is. There's a little table here. The table is only a suggestion. It's just to give you an idea of how you could possibly do this. And with this plan, it takes about 30 weeks which is around seven to eight months. And that's a realistic plan. If you try to do this too fast, you will be pushing yourself beyond your limits. You will damage the fine tissues in your lungs. You will agitate your nervous system. And you will damage your pranic vehicles irreparably. I have a question. Uh, so, uh, so regarding the uh, using the spine, the crown, basically using the length from the crown of the head to the uh, end of the spine as the you know measure of equal breathing. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing I have is let's say let's say my capacity is about fourteen or something like that. Normally, mm -hmm. normally using the number count, mm -hmm. my capacity is four. Yeah. Uh, now, when breathe, when using the spine as the measure of equality, mm -hmm. uh, if I try to reach my capacity, my normal capacity, mm -hmm. the problem seems to be that if I try to go slowly, uh, slowly to reach that capacity, somehow there is a lot of blocks in my spine. But mm -hmm. it's easier to do the spine equal breathing when I do it a little bit faster. It's smoother. So is it a worry that, uh, how to say, uh, if I do the same 14, which is my capacity, or if I try to do the 14, somehow there's a lot of blocks in my spine. Or it feels like I'm, you know, I'm not counting, but still, the slower I go along the spine, the harder it is. Uh, yeah, it's is harder. It okay? It's harder because your mind is having ta a hard time letting go of the numbers. And it's harder because now you're exactly getting to that subtler state and the mind is having a hard time grasping that and staying with it. Mm -hmm. You just have to keep doing it. The mind okay. gets the habit of it, begins to enjoy it. So you're saying it's not a big problem if I be breathe along the spine and I just do it a little bit faster because it's comfortable. Uh, I mean, you are uh, doing it faster because of what I said, that the mind is having a hard time dropping the numbers, it's having a hard time with the subtlety of the whole thing, it's having a hard time grasping that level of fineness. You know, they're saying, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, it's not, don't, don't take this personally, this is just an example that I've given, there are different kinds of students. So there's a student, he's, um, he's like an elephant, you know, if you try to sort out uh, some sugar which is in the sand you know how is the elephant going to do that it's going to have a hard time mm -hmm. now that's the first kind of student you know he, he remains more at a gross level he's not able to go to that subtle level the second kind of student is like a ant you know he's able to get all the sugar out of the uh, uh, sand mix in the sand so it becomes a little bit yeah he's a little bit more subtle he's able to grasp it and then there's the third kind of student, that's the finest, you know, the one who has adhikar. He's able to grasp very, very subtle things and hold on to it. And that's like a bee, you know, it's going to take out the little sugar and then it's going to take it back and it's going to turn it even into honey. 
-hmm. So <clears throat> you need to train your mind to stay with this level of subtlety, to hold on to it, to grasp it. Remember we have talked about uh, yogis who cannot remain established in the state of yoga. It's exactly this same problem. You are not able to stay in a subtler state. You, you know, you keep falling from that. You, know, you need more energy. You need to train your mind still. The manas, chitta, buddhi, ahankara create distractions then suddenly. This is too subtle. You yes. may want to consider either the idea of going back a step back to the counts or, okay, if you think that it helps to be a little faster, just helps you to first get rid of the numbers, but shorten your breath a little bit just so that you have a more subtler practice, then that's worth experimenting with. Yeah, so I am. I notice that uh, if it's faster, I'm easily able to let go of the counts. Yeah, I'm able to stay fine without the count. It's smooth. It's equal mm -hmm. as long as it's faster. Yeah. So yeah. Try it out and stick to that for a while, but try also eventually to elongate it because that's what we want to do. Also elongate. Yes. yes. Alright. So yes, to elongate it, um, here's the table. What was Aranka saying? Why we go up in two counts? We do still the same pound amount up and down? I, I don't get your question. We do the same up and down? Sorry, sorry, Aranka. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, actually, there's, these are two questions. So, um, <coughs> why are we going up in two counts? Uh, I you mean, mean from, from four, four, six, eight? Six. Yeah. Eight. And the second part yeah. of the question was? Is there a reason for that? Hmm. It seems to be the gentlest approach. But one count would take really long. Then you're talking about uh, over a year. And that's not required because that would be too slow and totally sort of under-stressing you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not a challenge anymore. It's not interesting enough. We get uh, lazy. Yeah, you get lazy, exactly. You just get bored <laughs> of it. You just get bored of it. And... Uh, and more than two would be sometimes pushing it because we all have busy lives and then we somehow tend to stop practicing in between or you suddenly have to go on a trip somewhere or something happens and, you know, then we get too ambitious. So this seems to work out as a kind of good plan. Okay. A, a realistic and, and plan. We, we still do the same amount up and down. I mean... Uh, we're still doing, for example, eight, eight, eight in, eight counts or eight seconds in, and eight counts or seconds out. Yeah, exactly. I yes. understand that right. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, because it's equal okay. breathing. It's even breathing. It's equal breathing. So you do the same amount in and same amount out. Yes. If you okay. follow this program, then in about seven to eight months, you could be having wonderful uh, practice with 30 seconds in and 30 seconds out. Oh, there's some lovely birds chirping there. Who's that? Matthew or, or was that somebody else? Mm. Maybe it's me. Oh, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Or oh, have you got some sound effects on your computer? <laughs> Looks like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, so uh, Radhika, one last question. So if yeah. I understand well, we first need to practice this equal breathing mm -hmm. uh, during practice time. Yes. But also when it's going to be like a natural something or is this, is this coming by the time? No, this program is meant for your practice. Uh, Ashish had asked the same question and I said during your normal breathing you're not expected to breathe uh, 30 in and 30 out at any point of time. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, this I is only, this program is for your practice time. And it might help in your normal breathing, it might make your normal breathing also a little deeper and if you've been doing two in and two out on a regular basis you might suddenly find that you're breathing slower, you're more relaxed, and you breathe a little deeper, and you're calmer. 
and you might find that you're suddenly doing four in and four out on a normal basis. I don't think um, you're going to go to 30 on a normal basis. Yeah, Nikalis, we just fit it in. Go ahead. What do you want to ask? Yeah, so it's, um, it's about the inhalation and exhalation ratio. Mm -hmm. um, so the, my, my question is, um, when you sleep into the, let's say, breathless state, mm -hmm. um, is, are you still kind of doing a one-to-one -one there, or is it more like a two-to-one? ratio. I'm just thinking, is there a difference if you're lying on your back because uh, gravity helps you exhale or... Uh, I'm not getting your question. You, you talked about the breathless state. Now you're talking about lying down or sitting. Sorry. Um, so my question is, um, when you forget that you are breathing, yeah. and if you do get into the breathless state where you're actually breathing you said mm -hmm. is that right yeah yeah so in that state are you still doing a one-to-one -one ratio breath or does it change and if it does change is it different to is it different if you're lying on your back or if you're in, in a in a sitting posture uh, the, the position doesn't matter it could be it either okay. yeah it could be either as for the ratio changing uh uh, if you're doing equal breathing, you're doing equal breathing. And if you're doing two to one, then you're doing two to one. The subtlety remains in either of the practices. Okay? Hmm. Okay, right? so, so it could be either. It could be either. It depends on what practice you're doing. It just becomes very fine. It's, it's a very subtle and very fine breath. And it's elongated. And it seems from to an external observer that you're not even breathing. Okay, and so that would then take us to step seven. Okay, so now this was only a overview of the seven steps. And in the next session, we will go into the other breathing practices where we use these, you know, not seven steps, but we use these uh, six steps all along. And then we have gained mastery in these six. Then at some point of time, you're going to be as I said here, at the threshold of point seven, beginning to understand, experience, and eventually attain mastery over prana itself. Okay? So, I think it's a good place to stop here. And we continue next Sunday with the other breathing practices. I think this was a, um, a good session. Hope you enjoyed it. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you, Radhika. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, Anju. Bye, Shibu. Bye, Gautam. Bye, Sujata. Thank you, Radhika. Welcome. Bye bye. Thank you and bye, Radhika. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye all. Bye everyone. Bye Scott. <laughs> bye Patricia. Oh and bye Debbie. Glad you could make it. Bye Shabu.